Hello, and welcome to the Space Guide for April 2025. And this month we have lots going on with the planets, and we also have our first big meteor shower of the year. If you're new here, I'm Sarah Matthews, and I'm an astrophotographer, and this series is all about helping you photograph different types of things in the night sky and give you helpful tips and tricks to do that. This video series is also about sharing really cool space facts and updates both in the space industry and also in the space sciences. If you'd like to share your ideas for this video series, please feel free to drop them down in the comments. And without further ado, as always, grab a snack and let's see what's going on with space this month. April's morning skies are buzzing with activity, so whether you are an early riser or just a night owl who is an absolute masochist, you are in for a treat. Because starting around April 1st, Mercury, Venus, and Saturn are going to be forming a pretty tight-knit group in the morning sky. What they're up to, nobody knows, but I'm sure it's very interesting. Over the first two weeks of the month, they're going to slightly drift southeast and rise early each morning, making them easier to spot as the month goes on. This is also going to be a decent chance to spot Saturn as it makes its return from hiding behind the sun for the last month or two. Meanwhile, Neptune is also going to be joining the lineup, kind of, although it is still very close to the sun, it does get in on the action on April 16th when it conjuncts with Mercury. And fun fact guys, Neptune has the fastest winds in the solar system. As we move later on into the month, Venus is going to steal the show as it normally does. It rises higher in the pre-dawn skies each day, and it's going to reach its greatest brightness on April 24th, as it shines brilliantly in the east. And on that morning, we have a beautiful conjunction with Venus and the moon. And what's really cool about this conjunction is that both the Venus and the moon are going to be crescent shaped. And this is gonna make a really cool photographic opportunity. So if you have a longer focal length telescope, you can make a composite of both the moon and Venus, or you could take a wide angle image and it would still be really cool. Next up, the moon. Now our full moon this month arrives on April 12th and it is a micro moon, but I'm sure many of you are wondering why is it a micro moon? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. We call it a micro moon because it occurs near the apogee of the moon's orbit or the point when it's farthest from earth. So the moon doesn't actually orbit the earth in a perfect circle. It's actually orbiting in an ellipse, which means that its distance to earth changes over time. So when a full moon appears near apogee, it's actually going to appear slightly smaller and actually is going to appear slightly dimmer. And that's why we call it a micro moon. And this is in comparison to when it's at its closest approach to earth, which is called its perigee. So to the naked eye, the difference is gonna be very subtle, but compared to a super moon, a micro moon can be about 14% smaller and 30% dimmer. Then on April 20th, just in time for the last quarter moon, the Lucy spacecraft is going to be making some big moves. So Lucy launched in 2021 and it's actually on its way to explore Trojan asteroids near Jupiter. And this month it's going to be doing a quick flyby by the asteroid Donald Johansson, which is basically going to be a mission critical checkpoint as it goes to the Trojan asteroids. Now asteroid Donald Johansson is actually named after the paleontologist who discovered the Lucy fossil. Now that we've got our new moon coming up on April 27th, this is of course the best time to capture and observe deep space objects. This is also a great time to do some great Milky Way shots in the early morning hours. So let's start off with the best deep space targets to observe and photograph, starting off with the Southern Hemisphere. First up on the list is the Prawn Nebula, and it is located at a distance of around 6,000 light years away. This is a bright emission nebula in the tail of Scorpius. It is big and bold and it's very beginner friendly. It's rich in H alpha emissions. And what's really cool is that with an emission nebula like this, where it's very bright, you can even photograph it in moderately light polluted areas, especially if you are using one of these narrow band filters or an astro modified camera. So a focal length between 200 millimeters to 500 millimeters is gonna be really great for this target. And for settings, I would recommend anywhere between 800 to 1600 ISO for a DSLR or mirrorless camera. That's going to be, of course, camera specific. If you have a Sony mirrorless full frame camera, you might want to check out higher ISO settings. This is also one of those targets that if you have pretty decent skies in terms of light pollution and you have a fairly fast telescope or camera lens, then you can collect data pretty quickly and you can get a pretty decent image within one night. Next up is the Colsack Nebula, and it is one of the most famous dark nebula in the constellation Crux. You will spot this near the Southern Cross, where it kind of looks like this dark void that's cutting into patches of stars. 
Now you can go fairly medium to deep with this target, but it's also one of those targets you can go fairly wide, anywhere between 50 millimeters to 135 millimeter lens would be fine. Of course, the more integration time that you can get, the better. As we've been talking about, the Milky Way core is rising earlier and earlier, which is really cool. So if you want to get an awesome Milky Way pano arch photo, this would be a great time to do that. Now, for those of us up north, or at least relative north to what we believe is north, because there's really no north or south or east or west in space, I digress. So for us here in the Northern Hemisphere, there are a lot of cool targets this month. Of course, we are right in the middle of galaxy season because we are pointed away from the galactic plane during the nights, but the Milky Way core is rising earlier and earlier, so you should be able to see it in the early hours in the southeast. Now, in terms of deep space objects, we have M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is a really lovely galaxy that just is lovely. And it is located a whopping 21 million light years away, which is really hard to fathom. And actually, I really can't even fathom that kind of distance. There are lots of H2 regions throughout its spiral arms, so you can image broadband or RGB, and then you can also image this with narrowband filters and merge it all together in post-processing later. Focal lengths between 500 millimeters and 1000 millimeters are probably gonna work best, but if you have a pretty small sensor like a 585 or a 533, then you might be able to get away with a much smaller focal length. And if you don't mind losing some resolution, then you can always crop. Another interesting target that I would recommend trying your hand out is called the Dark Shark Nebula. The Dark Shark Nebula is of course a dark nebula, but is also a reflection nebula. And together they make a beautiful space shark which who doesn't love a shark? Oh, and it's also located in the constellation Cepheus. We are wrapping up this month with one of the sky's oldest traditions, the Lyrid meteor shower, which happens to be the oldest recorded meteor shower that's still going on today. What's really wild is that humans, just like you and I, have been watching this meteor shower for 2,700 years. There are actual records dating back to 678 BC in China, which again is really wild. So the Lyrid meteor shower is going to be active from April 15th through April 29th. So make sure you do your taxes if you are in the United States or if you haven't already, but they are going to be peaking on the night of April 22nd, which is really great because the moon isn't going to be rising until much later that night. And we are also nearing at that point, a new moon. So head to dark skies and you should be able to see a few of them out there. Now, if you are going to be heading out to darker skies, you can expect to see anywhere between 10 to 20 meteors per hour. Uh, you don't need a telescope to view these. I would actually recommend just using a wide angle camera if you are going to try to photograph this or see them. And so here are some photography tips. Again, a wide angle lens, anywhere between 14 millimeters to 35 millimeters. You're going to want to also look from east to southeast. If you want to see them visually, make sure that you do, of course, go to our dark sky site. Also go to our dark sky area if you're going to photograph this anyways, but give yourself some time for your eyes to adjust anywhere between 25 to 35 minutes. And you can set your camera for continuous shooting or for long exposures and make sure you bring a tripod and extra batteries and of course some snacks, but please be responsible with your snacks and your garbage. Oh, and just a heads up, we have a, another fantastic meteor shower, probably an even more eventful meteor shower coming up next month. So, and also before I leave you, did you guys hear about the fact that we might be living in a black hole? Um, yeah, this is freaking crazy, but this has actually been postulated for a while now. JWST has some new data after it observed a lot of different galaxies and the direction that they spin doesn't really make a lot of sense, uh, but it could make sense if we are in a black hole, our universe, that is. So yeah, let me know down in the comments if you think we are living in a black hole, which is crazy. Anyways, until the next uh, video for next month, I hope you all have clear skies. Yeah. Thanks, guys.